Encamped Along the Hills of Light, or Faith is the Victory, whatever you know that song is. <clears throat> Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath, strapped on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, truth all girt about. The tree shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory, faith. faith is victory. <clears throat> oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. And to him that overcomes the foe, what raiment shall be given? Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in him. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, we'll vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone. I know we have some visitors today, and we have some that haven't been able to be here for a while that are back today, and so we're glad that, that all of you are here and uh, just really uh, excited that you're part of our time together today. Um, you know, I have a, you may not believe this, but I have a reputation for falling asleep at any time of day or night and at any moment. That's not good when you have guests in your house. Uh, it's not good when you're driving um, and, uh, you know, things like that. So uh, last night we were playing Pinochle and uh, we loved to do that, but I was falling asleep during the last game and Kaylee would, was my partner and she would, I would wake back up and I think she blamed the fact that we lost that one on the fact that I couldn't stay awake. But so. I say that today because, Ken, if I happen to like doze right here, just come on up and just roll me out of the way, okay? All right? It'll be fine. Uh, it's been a little bit of a busy week. Well, today, I, I want to I share some thoughts with you simply titled, This Is. Um, while I was in Texas a few weeks ago, I, I was introduced to a song with the title, We Praise You, and it was by a, a gentleman by the name of Brandon Lake. And, and in that song, there are three lines that really caught my attention. And as I listened to them and then went back and looked them up online to, to make sure that I had them right, it, they just, it just seemed like those were things that really stuck with me specifically from that song. And so I want to share some thoughts with you today about those things. And so this is what, these were those three lines from the song, We Praise You. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like, and this is what heaven looks like. And so today I want us to focus on each of those for a few minutes. And, and when you think of us as, as Christians, we are, we are richly blessed. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean necessarily that, that, that we have the wealth that other people have based on what the world would consider wealth. It doesn't mean that, that uh, we, we have more rights and privileges 
than anyone else or that the way the world would see that. And it doesn't mean that we're destined to, to all own a mansion in some ritzy community, even though the world may see that as something that would be coveted. But instead, we, we have much to be thankful for. Um, we have many reasons to praise God through our singing. We have many reasons to, to praise God through the way that we live our lives every day as well. Um, because he's done great things for us. He's done great things for us directly. He's done great things for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And he does great things for us through even our church family. And so um, I thought this would be this topic today. This is, with those three statements, something that as we think about things that we're thankful for in this particular time of year, this particular month, that often we may not think of these types of things that we're going to talk about today. We think more of, you know, our health, our clothing, our families, etc., all worthy of being thankful for. But today, I want us to focus on these three things. And so, this is what living looks like. You know, Paul wrote this in Philippians 1, uh, verse 21. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So, Living includes surrender. When we look about this is what living looks like, well, one of the things that, that it looks like or that it includes, it, in, it includes surrender. And, and I don't know about you, but I don't like giving up control of pretty much anything. Uh, Sarah reminded me that last night when she was driving and I was in the passenger seat, and I was like, there's a car coming, and you, know, you need to stop. And so she, yeah, I, I don't like giving up control. And maybe you're in the same boat. You know, you don't like it either. But here's the thing. When, when living includes surrender, that means that, that we need to surrender to the creator of the world and to the savior of all mankind in our living. And we need to do that because both of them, both God and Jesus, love us unconditionally. Um, and, and they bless us richly every day. We need to be able to surrender to them as part of our lives. And, and Jesus said that in order to, to follow him, we need to de deny ourselves, and that's part of that surrender. And, and James wrote that we need to humble ourselves, to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but to be humble. And then Paul reminds us, really, that it's by grace that we've been saved through faith, and so we need to accept God's gift of grace. All of those three things come under that idea that we need to surrender, that living includes surrender. Living also includes service. Um, we read in Romans that, that we all have different gifts, that we've been given those gifts, those special talents or those abilities to use them in certain ways. And so we've been given special gifts. And, and so how we do that, how we use those is really up to, to really how God has blessed us. Some people have been blessed with gifts like teaching or serving or encouraging or mentoring or, or ministering in some way. We've been given gifts. So it includes service. Living includes service. And so as Christians, we need to use our gifts for service to God, for service to others, as well as service to one another here in our church family. And, and what we gain from that, what we gain from that living uh, life of service are several things. We gain and we experience the joy found in serving. And we experience the fulfillment that's found in serving. We also experience spiritual growth that we will gain through living a life of service. And then we, we also experience discipleship. Because if we serve, we are mirroring exactly the example that Jesus set for us. So we're following his example by serving others, by serving God, by serving one another. So we would experience discipleship as well, all because we're living a life that includes service. Again, Paul's going to write in Romans 12, verse 1, he says this, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, that this is your true and proper worship. So 
living includes surrender. It includes service, but it also includes loving. Living includes loving. We talk about that. We've talked about that in our Bible class for some time now. We are the recipients of God's amazing love. We are the recipients of that. And so he gave us his son because he loves us. He blesses us because he loves us. He forgives us because he loves us. And then in John, John instructs us in 1 John verses, or verse 4, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 7, that we're to love one another because love comes from God. And we've talked about that even this morning. He would also write in 1 John 3, 18, that we aren't simply to love with words, but in, in our actions and in truth. So again, we need to love one another. That's what living includes when it includes loving. And we need to love with actions and in truth. And then, I don't know about you, but I don't know if you can imagine, I don't know that I can imagine a life void of love. A life where no one loves you or me, and you love no one. I don't know what that would be like, but what I do know is this, or what I believe is this, is that a life without love isn't really living. It's not living at all. But thankfully, as children of God and, and as brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't have to experience that. And as a result, we should make every effort, I think, to shower others with love and with kindness by the way we live and through our living. Again, now this time, John is going to write in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, And so we know and we rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives, lives in love. Whoever lives in love, lives in God. There we go. And God in them. See, I'm already, I don't know, the eyes are starting to close. <laughs> Whoever lives in love, lives in God and God in them. So when we talk about this is what living looks like. Living looks like a life of surrender. Living looks like a life of service. And living looks like a life of loving, of, that's full of love. How about freedom? This is what freedom looks like. Well, in, in, again, John, but this time in John 8, verses 34 through 36, John writes this. He says, Verily I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The word free there in the Greek means a couple things. It means to liberate. And so that makes sense, to set free, okay? To, to, to take us and set us free, that, to liberate us. That makes sense. And then the other, the other definition that it has is to exempt us from liability. In other words, it keeps us from, it allows us to do things. Not only does it, set to, does it liberate us, but being free allows us to do certain things. And so what freedom feels like, we can experience these blessings through our freedom. The things that Jesus freed us from, that's the liberate part. And the things that Jesus freed us to, and that's the exempt from liability, the things that we can just go and do because Jesus has freed us to do that. And so I want us to look at a couple of things that I think Jesus freed us from and then things that Jesus freed us to because this is what freedom feels like. Jesus freed us from the bondage of sin. Before we were baptized into Christ, you and I were prisoners that were held in bondage, bondage to sin. We were held captive by the impulses of sin. And we were bound to the instincts of sin. That was what we, our life was like. I mean, that's just the way things were. And then we were powerless, really, to overcome the influence of sin. We were in the bondage of sin. But the good news is Jesus set us free. We're no longer powerless against the bondage of sin, because Jesus died for us to set us free, to give us a life that's not controlled by sin. 
Another thing that we've been freed from by Jesus is the penalty of sin. When we were living outside of Jesus, we all had an eternal death sentence. Outside of Jesus, we have an eternal death sentence. And we're on a path of eternal separation from God's very presence. If we're not in Jesus, we're not on a path that's going to take us to God. But you know what? Jesus removed our death sentence. He removed it. He took on our punishment on the cross. So whatever penalty that we really deserve to be levied upon us, that we really deserve to suffer, Jesus took that on. He freed us from that penalty of sin. Amen. Another thing, in, here in, in Romans, again, Paul's writing, he says, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we were destined to. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus freed us from that penalty of sin, that death that was surely to come. Another thing that we're freed from is this, the guilt and the shame of sin. I'm sure, and, and I'm not looking for any show of hands because mine would be up too. We've all done things that we're ashamed of if we look back on our lives. I mean, we've done things that we maybe wish we could go back and do over again and this time do them better or do them different or not do them at all. We all have the capacity, I think, too often to, to relive those, those bad moments. And we, we question sometimes why we did what we did when we think back on those things that we just wish we'd never done. And that tends to create guilt and shame on us internally. We feel guilt and shame as a result. But, and you know, the thing about that is this, Satan wants us to hold on to that guilt and shame. Yep. He wants us to do that. And the reason he wants us to do that, one of the reasons he wants us to do it is because by us holding on to, to that guilt and shame, it strips us of the joy and the peace that we have through Jesus Christ. If we always remember and hold that guilt and shame every day, then we're going to miss out on all the joy, the peace, the gifts that God gives to us through Jesus. And so that's, that's Satan's motivation. We've, got to, we've been set free from that guilt of shame and shame of sin because Jesus' blood washes us clean as a result. And we experience not only a new beginning but a new birth when, we become, when we're baptized into Jesus Christ. We get that, and, and he's removed all the sin from us when, he wa when we're washed clean through Jesus in baptism. And God forgives us, and he removes the sin. So, so he takes it away, and he forgets it. It's us that are guilty of feeling guilty and continuing to feel guilty instead of realizing that we've been set free. We've been liberated from the guilt and shame of our sin by Jesus' death on the cross. Jesus freed us from that. Paul writes in Galatians, he says this, he says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. That slavery is the guilt and shame that Satan wants to keep us kind of locked into. Where we walk around with our heads bound down and it's like, oh, woe is me. And, and we're just, we, there's no joy there. That's what Satan wants. That's that bond of slavery. Slavery to sin, slavery to Satan. And, and Jesus, he wiped that out. Man. So those are three things that, that really Jesus set us free from. The bondage of sin, the penalty of sin, and the guilt and shame of sin. There's a couple things that Jesus set us free to. Jesus set us free to live. He died so we could live. We just read a scripture about how the penalty was death. Well, Jesus set us free to allow us to live here as well as in eternity. Being free from a, a bondage of sin and a penalty of sin enables us to, I think, to increase our capacity, our ability to experience love and to experience joy and peace and life. Mm -hmm. Because we can experience that and we can fully grasp that when we don't have to worry about 
the guilt and the shame and all those other things. Because Jesus has enabled us to live. To live here on earth, to bless one another, to be blessed by him, to, to reach out and care for others. He's given us the ability to do that. And when we do that, then we can experience love and we can experience joy and peace and we can experience life, the life that Jesus promised us to have. You know, he, he also freed us to increase our relationship with God. You know, in the Old Testament, I think uh, we talked about it earlier today, this morning, but, you know, we, the, the Israelites, God's chosen people, you know, their thoughts of God was when they went to the, the temple and he was kind of this thing behind the curtain, kind of like, you know, in the Wizard of Oz, you know, it's behind the curtain. And that was as close as you could get. But we don't have that anymore. We have the ability, we're free to increase our relationship with God, to get to know him, to talk with him, to experience him in our lives. Jesus has set us free to do that. Jesus freed us to focus on building and maintaining those healthy relationships that we can, that we have the ability to do because he freed us to do that. And those relationships involve relationships with one another as well as with God and with Jesus. We have the ability to do that. We're free to do that. John said this. He says, I, and this is, he's quoting Jesus, Jesus' words here. So, red letter, right? See, Chris, right? Red letter words. This is Jesus saying, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And I think as Christians, we have been given the freedom to have an awesome life here not based by worldly standards, but based by just the fact that God is part of our lives, but also he freed us and he gave us life to the full because of what we can anticipate and expect at home in heaven. Another thing that Jesus freed us to, he freed us to serve. And we talked about that a little bit ago, but there's a, there's a, a section here that I really want us to emphasize. You know, he has work for us to do. There's a lot that he gave us to do. When he ascended to heaven, he gave, he looked at his disciples, his apostles, and basically said, okay, you're my hands now. You're my mouth now. You're my feet. You've got the, you've got the responsibility to serve because I'm not here to do it. Well, we have that responsibility as well. We have that opportunity. He has work for us to do. And so we were saved by grace and we live by grace. We gain God's approval, not by things we do, but because of what Jesus did for us. Jesus died for us, and so as we put Jesus on in baptism, we become his children, we have the ability to serve. We have the ability to serve. We're free to serve, really, from hearts that should be motivated by love for him, by love for Jesus, by love for God. That should be what motivates us, not a feeling of have to, oh, do I have to? Do I have to clean my room? Do I have to, you know, put the dish in the sink? No, we have the freedom to serve because we should be motivated by love. So when we see people in need, when we see one another in need, when we meet people on the street who we don't even know, but who we automatically see a need that they have for that moment in time that we are intersecting with their life, we have the ability to, to serve them in some way and should be motivated to do that by the love that we have for God and for Jesus Christ. Here's the, here's the thing I want you to think about. <clears throat> Freedom is not the right to do what we want. As Christians, some people want to say that and some people want to apply that. Well. You know, that, oh, you know, I've got freedom in Christ, so I can go do anything I want, <clears throat> any way I want, to anyone I want. I can do anything. I'm free. I'm free. No, that's not the freedom that we have in Jesus. Freedom is not the right to do what we want. Here's the, here's the kicker. It's the ability to do what we ought. Jesus freed us to do the things that he has in store for us to do that, that he's left for us to do. 
Because if we don't do it, it's not going to be magically done. We have the ability to do that. And so those are the things that we ought to do. And we are free to see that. We don't have to have a church business meeting to decide, hey, you know what? The sidewalk needs shoveled because there's a lot of snow. Maybe we ought to have a business meeting to decide who's going to do that. We don't have to do that. And that's a simple thing. We don't have to have a business meeting to say, oh, you know, there's this family in need. You know, I, they, you know, I really, we probably ought to meet and talk about how we can help them. We have the ability to just don't do that. We don't have to have bureaucracy. We have our hearts that belong to God. Those are the things we ought to do, and we're free to do that. This is what freedom feels like. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So those are those things. We're free to do what we ought. We're living a life that we've been freed to live and to serve because of Jesus. And then this is what heaven sounds like. This is from Revelation. It says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and strength and honor and glory and praise. Heaven sounds like a place of praise. In fact, it's a place of praise and singing. Imagine all the, just like in that passage in Revelation, imagine every inhabitant in heaven uniting together to praise the Lamb of God. When that happens, there's universal harmony in that. They're all focused, all of the hosts in heaven, which we hope to be there. We want to be there, included in those hosts. There will be universal harmony. There will be rejoicing in the Lord. That's what heaven's going to sound like. All of that praise and that singing. And we'll join with the angels in singing praises to God. Those, that passage in Revelation about the angels were there in thousands and ten thousands times ten, ten thousands. Imagine the sound of that praise and that singing. That's what heaven is going to sound like. The psalmist wrote, praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. In Psalm 148. So one of the things that heaven is going to sound like, it's, going to, it's a place of praise and singing, and that's what it sounds like. It's also a place of joy and celebration. There's, imagine a life, imagine living without criticism at all, without hateful words being spoken, without gossip, without anger, without any condemnation. You know what that's like? That's heavenly. And that's what's going to happen. It's going to be a place of joy and celebration, not criticism and condemnation, not hatred and anger, but celebration. It's heavenly. There's not going to be any death. And it, we find this in, in Revelation. It, it, it's not going to talk about in Revelation 21. It says that there's no more death. No more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. So if all those things are gone, what does that leave? Joy and celebration. We have much to be joyful about, much to celebrate. That's what heaven is going to sound like. A place of joy and celebration. So instead of all that anger that's, and that, that negativity that sometimes can really take the joy out of us here on this earth, the sounds that we'll hear are sounds of joy and celebration. That's what heaven will sound like. And then it's also going to be a place filled with sounds of home. Sounds of home. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. What does your home sound like over the holidays when your family gets together? Hopefully it's sounds of joy when that happens and, and not 
other things, but, or how does it sound, what's the sounds like when maybe your life group is meeting together, or during a potluck when the church is together, or even before services and after services, you know, when we're just mingling with one another. What does that sound like? Well, you know, we'll hear the wonderful sounds of our earthly homes, of, of life here, but it's going to be multiplied by the thousands in heaven. It's going to be so much greater all those wonderful things that, you know, I, I know when we look forward to, I know our family does and many of yours does too, during the holidays, Thanksgiving's coming, Christmas is coming, and, and we, you know, one of the things that we have done so far every year is we are together as a family, and many of you are together with your family because you just love the sounds of what it makes your home feel like when everybody's together. Multiply that and imagine what that's going to be like in heaven with all those hosts with all those other christians with all the angels it's going to be amazing we'll also hear the perfect sounds of love and companionship and thankfulness and we'll hear those in heaven not just for a day like oh yeah it was a good day today no every day for eternity that's what heaven is going to sound like it's going to, we'll hear the sounds of love and companionship and thankfulness throughout eternity. And then we'll hear words from our Heavenly Father echo throughout heaven, our home. Emphasis on just that, our home. That's where we'll be. So what does heaven sound like? Heaven sounds like praising and singing. Heaven sounds like joy and celebration. And we'll hear God's voice in heaven because that's where our home will be. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians this, he says, for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. We'll be in heaven and we'll know what heaven sounds like. You know, earlier, Ken uh, led a song, That's Why We Praise Him, it's it's one of my favorites, and, and it's one of our newer songs. And, and my hope is that the more that we sing that, that it won't just be a song that we sing on a Sunday morning, but instead that the words to that song will become so familiar to us that, that it'll fill our hearts and it'll really move us to, to even greater praise and to bring even greater glory to God, because that's what the song's about. And so I think so many times our songs that we sing if all we do is leave them on the words on a piece of paper, we miss out. Yeah. It's taking those words and the meaning of those words and we pull them into our lives and, and they become part of our DNA, who we are. And so it's part of who we are to just naturally then praise God and, and to, to be joyful about all the blessings we have. And so I hope that that song becomes that for, for all of us because we have much to be thankful and praiseful about to God as well as to Jesus Christ, because heaven is going to sound just that way. So here's what I think. I'll leave you with this. The more our hearts, I think, are filled with gratitude and praise, the deeper we'll understand what living looks like as Christians. We'll appreciate what freedom feels like because of Jesus Christ and will rejoice in what heaven sounds like. That's what I believe. You know, this morning, I just wonder if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, if you haven't experienced the freedom that's found really in becoming a follower of his, if then how can you, how can you even possibly experience the sounds of heaven? So, if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, no better time than right now to do that as we stand and sing.